Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and I am back again with Kinsey. And today, we're here to talk about some great games for your Nintendo Switch that are under $20. All right, let's take a look. All right, so I'm gonna go first, and the first game that I wanna talk about, because I think it's so awesome, is Immortal Redneck. Have you heard of this game? <laughs> I have not, but I am intrigued. It is a really weird game, but it's pretty awesome. So basically, this is a first-person shooter set in Egypt, and it has a lot of things that are really cool about it. For one, it's very old-school shooter. So we're talking like Quake, Doom, Serious Sam, those kind of games where you're basically just running around, shooting everything. I don't think there's any plot whatsoever, at least certainly no <laughs> plot I've ran into, and it doesn't really matter. What's cool about this game though, is that it is roguelike in that it is randomly generated every single time you play. That's pretty sweet. So it's a first person shooter that's randomized like that. And it's set in Egypt and there's a bunch of really cool things about it. The, the number one thing for me, when I hear randomly generated, that can either be a really great thing or it can be something that is kind of not so great. This is this lands safely in the awesome category. Like you can really tell that the developers knew how to mix up how those those levels are built so not only just in like what they place in there but also the verticality of it there's some levels that are incredibly deep there's some of them that are big and essentially what happens is that you walk into a room and you're locked in there until you take out all the enemy oh that's cool and what's great too because it's randomized you think well how am i going to get through this thing with without getting lost the mini map is is always showing you where like the next door is so it's a fantastic game, really well designed. Also too, uh, it's very much like an RPG and very roguelike in that if you die, which you will always die, <laughs> uh, you have coins to spend to upgrade your skill tree. And so even when you're dying a lot, you're still progressing because you're still upgrading your character. There's also other characters that have special abilities that, that you can unlock. Um, one little tip for people though that I highly recommend is try to get double jump as soon as possible because the main goal in this game is to try to get to the top of the pyramid. And so you are always trying to go up and so having double jump unlock as soon as possible will help you greatly. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a fantastic <laughs> game. Uh, it also has motion controls. I didn't really play around with those too much, but I know people were really excited about that. Especially people who are not necessarily good with uh, with the thumbsticks on a shooter, you can use motion controls. So pretty cool. That's awesome. So it's not roguelike in the sense that it has permadeath? No, it's the opposite of permanent. That's nice. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Is it's that the die a lot? It's the die a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. You'll progress by dying in this game. Sweet. But I put a ton of time into it, and it, it's very addictive. And for my first game, I'm picking Battle Chef Brigade. This game, like, kind of came out of nowhere for me. I know it kind of blew up on the internet, but it's such like a cool thought. Like, I think IGN put it that it's. Like the plot is Iron Chef meets Tolkien. Hmm. I know, right? Weird. <laughs> that won me over. I was like, I need to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> so you play as Mina. She comes from a small town working in her family's restaurant, but she's got bigger dreams. She's gonna go off and try to join the Battle Chef Brigade. And to get there, you have to go through a number of challenges hmm. in like this capital city place. And it has kind of visual novel aspects. It has some like daily puzzles that you can do. It has platforming and like action combat. Hmm. But in the end, it's really just a match three game. Really? Yeah. I love <laughs> match three games. Yeah. I'm, I'm addicted to them. When you break it down, that's kind of what this is. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, because you use flavor crystals to flavor and make your dishes. And all those really are is you have like the green ones resemble earth flavor, water, fire, things like that. Hmm. And you can start to make more complex dishes. And the more kind of ingredients you put in, like the more complicated your dish gets, it'll level up, the more points you'll earn. Hmm. But what I think is really cool about this game is when you do a challenge, you start in the kitchen, it's very Iron Chef. They're like, the people are here to battle it out. Oh, it's really? It's very like ostentatious. Get, get, and like, get, get the audience hyped up. <laughs> yeah, it's very much like that. You have like a, all the like contestants have nicknames. You're the Iron Stomach. Okay. <laughs> so it's very like Iron Chef. But once the match starts, you have to go outside then and gather your ingredients. 
huh. which is really cool. Is that match three or? Nope, that is. Oh, okay. Platforming action combat. I see, okay. And it's so fun. And you kind of have to weigh your odds because all the challenges are timed. Hmm. So you can, the more difficult enemies yield better ingredients, but they also take longer to kill and you might die in the process. Hmm. So you have to decide, am I just gonna like gather some berries real quick and run back in and cook? Hmm. So I really like how you have to prioritize your time and do you want to take that risk to make a better dish. Okay. And so once you get all your ingredients back in the kitchen, you can add them together, do the match three, and you have to present it to the judge. And of course, all the judges have different flavor profiles. So there's always the secret ingredient, just like in Iron Chef. Hmm. And, but then the, the judges will be like, you know, I really like spicy dishes. So then you're like, okay, I gotta do this, I gotta make a dragon dish, and it's gotta be spicy. Okay. But there's so much going on, and the writing's great. It has kind of a Miyazaki-ish kind of art style. Looks very hand-drawn. All the backgrounds, I think, are hand-drawn. Hmm. And it's beautiful. I love it, actually. Okay. Well, it's funny you mentioned <laughs> hand-drawn, mm -hmm. because the next game I want to talk about, actually, is very hand-drawn. Have you played the Banner Saga yet? I've seen so much about it. It looks beautiful. It is. So th one of the things, I didn't realize this until I was doing some research. Uh, so the Banner Saga is, a, is an epic RPG. It's part of a trilogy. And uh, as a matter of fact, depending on when you watch this video, either the third one will, will be out or is coming out. So, But here's the thing, though. It's developed by people who, from BioWare. Oh. That's why it's so quality. Hold the phone. Yes. Yeah, so ex Bioware uh, employees left there, obviously, did a Kickstarter, and that's what that's where the first uh, Banner Saga came out of. And the graphics, as you guys are seeing on the screen here, are absolutely gorgeous, hand-drawn. Um, basically, like I mentioned, it's, it's part of, a, of an epic trilogy. So what's nice is that each game is not too long. They're about 10 to 12, maybe 15 hours. And... Um, like I said, hand-drawn, excellent story and writing, laugh out loud. This is one of those games too where depending on what you choose, so you're gonna choose how the story progresses. You're gonna have to make moral decisions about who you keep, who lives, who dies. And sometimes it's rough, but again, it carries through the game all the way, supposedly till the third game. That's cool. It is very cool, very well written. Um, and then basically the, the way it works is that it's kind of two games where you are in the story-driven part where your your clan is traveling through the countryside and, and running into people, running into enemies, running into friends and foes. And then it goes into a uh, isometric, tactical, turn-based combat system. And that is also really well thought out as well. So you can tell that these people, these developers, played a lot of these type of games. Those graphics are also hand-drawn. Uh, multiple difficulty levels, I want to mm -hmm. mention that because this game is brutal. Oh. <laughs> it's tough. And I played a lot of these games and initially I was dying a lot because you really have to think through combat. You have to plan, you have to know exactly whatever all the stats are. It's very cool. I absolutely love this game. So uh, looking forward to playing the second and third one. And I know that those are coming to the Switch as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's the series I've had my eye on for a while. I think yeah. it's been on my Steam wish list for like way too long yeah. and I don't really play on Steam. Yeah. So. Switch, that should be where it's at. It is, it's nice to have it on the go, for sure. And my next game is actually one that, if you follow me on any sort of social media, I won't shut up about it, you right. know. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, and it finally came to Switch, so you know what, now it qualifies for this video. Woohoo! <laughs> and that is Night in the Woods. It's it's kind of a hard game to categorize, because it's not, it's not a walking simulator. It's not really a point and click adventure game. It's kind of somewhere in between. Hmm. But it has so many secrets to discover that it's like way more than meets the eye. And when you get down to it, it's a 2D action platformer. But what's really cool is it's just like small town America, but there's something sinister happening and you don't quite know what it is yet. You think it might just be all you, but the premise is that you come home from college because you drop out and you're kind of having that like early 20s existential crisis hmm. and you came back to your hometown your friends all have jobs and moved on with their lives and you're like i'm back <laughs> and at first Ready to party yeah and at first that's exactly what it is you go to the woods and you drink and you make a fool of yourself because you see your ex-boyfriend <laughs> This is very relatable because, I mean, I think we've all had kind of those moments in our mm -hmm. lives. And it, it, the dialogue is so good. Hmm. It's written super conversational, so I had a smile on my face, like, the whole game. Huh. 
And it doesn't just have, you know, the adventure and like story elements. It does break up gameplay pretty good. Like there you you get the old band back together. So there's a rhythm game. Oh, part. actually band. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, you play bass. Not <laughs> great, but <laughs> it's funny first band practice. They're like, "We have your old bass." And you're like, "What?" <laughs> know how to play and they're like you got it it's fine it's totally fine <laughs> but it also deals with mental illness in a really cool way because you kind of see something's going off with the main character but you're not quite sure what it is yet mm -hmm. but you kind you also get to play within her dreams so interesting how a lot of games recently are really starting to dig a little bit deeper into mm -hmm. kind of situations that you know, normally aren't explored in games. Yeah, yeah, and this does it in a really beautiful way. Yeah. Where it's not like, oh, well, something's wrong because May is depressed. Like, it doesn't outwardly say it. Huh. So it does it in such a beautiful artistic way. It still keeps it kind of lighthearted and funny most of the time. Right. <laughs> it gets a little dark. <laughs> but it's just such a fantastic game. And I mean, I originally played this game over a year ago. And I still won't shut up about it. <laughs> so... <laughs> That is, that's cool. Yeah, it's definitely a game we're checking out. Huh, okay. Well, next up for me is a game that's very different than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's fantastic, and I was so excited to see it came to the Switch. That is called The Framed Collection. So this is two games, and they are puzzle games unlike anything I've ever played personally myself. Mm -hmm. So the way that this works is that it's, a, it's kind of like a film noir where you are a spy. You're not exactly sure what's going on in the beginning of the game where you're a spy, you have a briefcase, you're trying to basically get away from the cops. And it's very much, it looks like a comic book. So your character will run across a panel and then in the next panel there may be a cop standing there. Well, you get caught, but you can move the panels around. So for instance, if there's a panel that's below that that has like say an alleyway, you put that panel first, your character runs, hits the alleyway, and then, then it goes to the panel with the cop. So you can rearrange the story in real time. What? It's awesome. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Aw it's awesome. <laughs> so that's how this game works. It's very simple, yet it gets complex as it goes along because you have more panels in there, and you you have to kind of think about you have, you have to sort of think about the different panels. And okay, my character would hit here, go down the alleyway. Let's move this up here, or like like if if the character uh, encounters a. Um, a ladder or a, or a pair of stairs, well, that'll take them up above the cop. And then you can rearrange it in any way you want. It's really cool. It even gets crazier later on when you can actually turn panels. So for instance, uh, something that might be a stairs going up, you can turn it to going down. It's, like I said, it's unlike anything I've ever played before. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Each game is, I think about three to four hours long. You're blowing my mind right now. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's so, so cool. And again, it's, it's unlike anything I've ever played personally. So when it came to Switch, I was very excited. I had to rebuy it, so. And next up for me is Oxenfree. A game I've heard of, but I know nothing about. And it's funny because when I started it, I was in that camp. Okay. Like I had just like heard a decent amount about it, basically in title only, like gotta check out Oxenfree. And I was yeah. like, what is this? Yeah. And so when I bought it, and I didn't really know what to expect. And guess what? It's like a horror game. <laughs> huh. From that, from that title, I would not guess that. No. And it's way different than what I was expecting. So the basic premise is every year in this small Pacific Northwest town, hmm. like a bunch of teenagers go to this island that's like a decommissioned military island kind of turned tourist trap. Hmm. So this is basically a ghost story. But the way they started off is so cool. You're like in this cave and they're like, yeah, you know, the kids who come here, they say if you stand by these rocks and tune into the radio, some weird stuff happens. That's where you actually signal the ghost for the first time. And they kind of talk in weird military, like almost riddles. Like they use like the language for the alphabet with military thing that I can't think of, tango. Oh, okay. I know what you, I don't know what it's called either. <laughs> I don't know what it's tango, called. Tango, bravo, all that stuff. Yeah, okay. so they like use a little bit of that. And then at one point they're like, is leave possible? And you're like, I guess. Hmm. So they're basically, now you're stuck. And they're like, we're gonna get off this island and they're gonna help us. Hmm. And then you end up in all these weird like time loops and like it just gets really? crazy fast oh, okay. yeah and the in and this game it's you know 2d rather unassuming looking but it had like i jumped a couple times oh really yeah it had jump scares. not very many but i was like oh damn. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just not what i was expecting at all and the main part of this game is the story 
It does have the radio mechanic and it has a few other things and platforming and things like that, but it does have branching dialogue. And the way it does it, I think is really cool. Like it's very conversational. Someone's talking to you and then you get three dialogue boxes above your head, but they're like timed basically because mm. it's, it's conversational. The yeah. conversation's happening in real time. Okay. And if you don't respond, the conversation will continue without you. Oh, interesting. Which I think is really, yeah, really cool. That is cool. It keeps it going. Yeah. You don't, there's no time to wait. Cause <laughs> I mean, like if we're talking and you're like, Hey Kinsey, what about this? And I'm like, Hmm. <laughs> I would assume you've fallen asleep. Yeah. <laughs> but I just really like the way they did it. Okay. And what's great about this game is it is $19.99, but it goes on sale all the time for $4.99. That's what I bought it for, yeah. like, a while ago. And I think at that price point and the amount it goes on sale, it is so worth it. Hmm. Okay. Well, speaking of horror-themed games, mine is also that. It's funny how that, that, that worked out that way. <laughs> um, this is called Death Road to, to Canada. Oh, I'm in. I know. So <laughs> this is another game where a lot of people are talking about. They were so excited it was coming to the Switch, um, and I had to pick it up. So basically what this is, this is The Walking Dead meets Oregon Trail. <laughs> And Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so you know, the classic Oregon Trail is right. Like you, you're, you're you're in a covered wagon. You're trying to get to Oregon. You're you're going through all these trials and tribulations to get there. Uh, this game's very much like that. So you start in Florida, and you and your buddy hop in a car. It's zombie infested apocalypse in America. But you you get an inkling that up in Canada they're safe, and so that's the plan. Is that you need to survive a certain number of days on the road to get to Canada. And I've come so close. Oh my God, so this game is so much fun. So basically it's completely randomized every single time you play it. Everything mm -hmm. is randomized. The people, the locations, the, the stuff you encounter, the weapons, all of it. And it's so brilliant because like the Oregon Trail, you run into scenarios where you know, you're cruising down the road and maybe you meet up with some, you know, a random person who is, seems come crazy out of their mind on the site. Do you help them? Ooh. Do you, do you leave them there? And that can have repercussions as it goes on. Um, a lot of moral choices. It's a very funny game, surprisingly funny for being a zombie game, but laugh out loud. Like at one point, uh, I picked up Elvis. <laughs> and and he sings <laughs> and uh also too another thing that's kind of funny is that you can also create your you can create your own characters that may or may not show up in it so i created myself on the main menu and sure enough in my game after a while metal jesus showed up but i don't know in what condition he is so oh. so do i trust metal jesus do i not uh, it, it, thankfully it turned out that uh metal jesus was a ninja <laughs> Oh, sweet. I was going to be like, well, I've been down that road before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it, it's definitely a really fun game. Um, so it has the Oregon Trail aspect of it. Every once in a while, a couple times a day, you have to get out of your car and forage for supplies or mm. weapons or try to find people. And um, that's really fun. So you're trying to find gasoline for your car. You're trying to find medical supplies, food, weapons, stuff like that. Absolutely charming game. Uh, so much fun. It's one of those games where when you die, you just want to do it again. You just want to, okay, because I, 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 I've never been to Canada, like in the game. Gotta get there, man. I gotta get there. I want to survive. <laughs> I want to see what happens. Although knowing this game, don't spoil it for me, but it's probably messed up. It's probably funny when it gets there. So that that's my guess. <laughs> so next up for me is Golf Story. And I think this is actually the only one on my list that's actually an exclusive. That's not on PC, that's okay. not on, now that I said it, it better be true. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really charming golf RPG. And what I love about it is it has the retro style graphics. So it reminds me of playing Mario Golf on the Game Boy. Okay. Like it just brought up all those like feelings again where yeah. I was like, this is the best. <laughs> like, I don't even like golf. <laughs> But what I it's such like a tale of an underdog. So it all starts, you break up with your girlfriend, you tell her, I'm gonna go be a pro golfer. And that goes well. <laughs> but, and you go back to the course that your dad originally taught you how to play golf on, is like the, the premise. Hmm. And you're, you have a lot of challenges ahead of you because you can't just walk into a golf club and be like, I'm gonna be a pro golfer. Everyone's like, whatever kid. <laughs> So you have like reluctant coaches, like a really disheveled course that hasn't been as well cared for in a few years, kind of like a shady guy who owns it. So you have like all these obstacles to get through hmm. before you even get to play golf. Like, hmm. 
So, but, so it, it's it's a really story driven yes. RPG. Oh yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's not short on the golf though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's awesome. Like the golfing feels so good. I believe there's eight different courses, so they they mix it up really well. Like there's a course that is like island based, and that one's kind of hard because it's like a bunch of little islands. Hmm. So there's a lot of water traps. <laughs> I remember when this game was announced for Switch, and I don't know what I, don't, I didn't buy it, but I mm. wanted to. I think it came out at a time whenever other games were out, and I just it kind of got lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So I'm really glad you mentioned it here because kind of bummed. I, I want to pick it up. It's so good. Huh. It's so good. Uh. <laughs> I've never wanted to like pick up and play a golf game so much. The mechanics are solid. The writing is great. Like the actual story and it's very conversational the way they did the writing. Mm. And even with the little speech bubbles, sometimes the words are really little and sometimes they're gigantic. Okay. And sometimes they're like, well, I tried. And they like the speech bubble goes up and then it slants to the side. <laughs> Like, just every little nuance huh. about it. Like, it's really well done. It's really fun. And the golf is super solid. All right. Well, that's cool. And my last game is Cat Quest. Oh, my gosh. You were so excited oh when gosh. this got announced. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> this game is incredibly self-aware of how ridiculous it is, which is one of my favorite things about it. It just makes it super charming. And you're going on a possum adventure. <laughs> okay full of tons of cat puns. And if you're a cat person, like I am, right. <laughs> it just, you know, doubles the charm. Yeah. But it's also a really fun RPG. Hmm. So the basic premise of this game is your sister gets kidnapped by this evil, like, wizard guy who uh, brought the dragons back to the land. Because the land used to be at peace, of course. Of course. And then you find out you're actually a dragon blood, which is an ancient bloodline of the only cats who can defeat dragons. Hmm. It's kind of Skyrim-y. Yeah, yeah. But I liked it, and I think it was very aware that it was channeling Skyrim. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, I mean, I love Skyrim. I love cats. Mush them together, but, like, <laughs> not exactly. Because it is, like, very indie. It is pretty simple. The gameplay is very a slash and dodge kind of mechanic. But it makes it enjoyable. Like, you're also not just, like, kill, 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 kill. When you start, you actually do have to dodge or okay. else you'll die. Oh, cool. <laughs> and you can get upgradable magic spells, which are sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it's so fun. It does get to a point where you are, like, godlike. And I do like this in games. We were where, talking about this, yes. Yeah, yeah, like, and it's not till the, like, pretty much the very end. So it's... Right. It's fine. But, but like, it is really fun at the end of these RPGs mm -hmm. when you are just like mowing down people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, you've earned it. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And the secret weapons and the gear in this is great. So you better find them. Okay. <laughs> They're so good. <laughs> and you get really great upgrades that'll expand the world a little bit, like being able to swim and things like that. So you can get to different islands. And there's even some like secret islands that are super cheeky super fun <laughs> so worth it to explore in this game and yeah like i said it doesn't overstay its welcome it's not too long but it is an rpg it has really fun satisfying gameplay sometimes the dungeons can get a little bit stale because they're not super creative but you know for the price of this game i don't think it really hurt that at all for me but i loved it you know it's funny i'm thinking about this the amount of variety on the switch is it, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's a little of everything on this thing. I mean, first-person shooters. I, we had all these puzzle games, RPGs, indie games. It's amazing. Yeah, and like I was telling you earlier, I was actually having trouble pairing my choices down to five. Yeah. I realized for half the time I was thinking about it, I had six. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap. I did, too. I did, too. <laughs> I know. And so we want to here at the end, just mention a couple things here. One, you know, we chose games that are $20 or under, but actually mm -hmm. a lot of these go on sale. Oh yeah. And it, Nintendo is putting these, you know, not only these games, but all sorts of games on sale all the time. So what I do is if a game comes out and I'm interested in, and maybe it's $29, I add it to my wish list. Oh yeah. And I mean, why not? Right. And then who knows, maybe a month or a week or Two months from now, it'll be 50% off. Mm -hmm. I was looking on there today and actually, uh, I forget what game it was, but it was 80% off. It was basically nice. like $2 when it was normally 20 or something. Yeah. So, I know. Oxenfree does that all the time. Yeah. It's like five bucks all the time. Yeah. So good. Which, which, you know, as you guys noticed, we covered all digital games in this video. We obviously are physical collectors. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if there were physical versions of this at the time of this, we would prefer that. But I, the reason why I bring it up is because when they're digital and they're cheap, that's usually when I'll buy those. Yep. You know what I mean, 
And if, you know, some of these games I love so much that if down the road they came out physical, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd, I'd probably I'd be first them. in line. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. So we'd love to know down in the comments, you know, so many games on the Switch, which ones would you like to see in a part two? Because mm -hmm. we already have a couple games for that as well. We'd love to know what you guys think. So uh, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at Kinzilla, K-I-N-S-Z-I-L-L-A, -L -L and on YouTube. Awesome. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing, and take care. Hey, guys, Metal Jesus here, and I'm back again with Kinzie. And we are here to talk about 10 great Switch games under $20. I know, this is going to be awesome. Let's take a look. All right, so what's your first game? So my first game is Donut County. When you told me about this, I was like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> this game is so amazing. Yeah. It's a puzzle game, and the premise is is that there's the character Mira, who's a human, and then BK, who's a raccoon who works at this donut shop. <laughs> and BK gets super into this new app that he can deliver donuts to people. And if he gets so many points, he gets a quad captor. And that's like all he cares about. A quad copter. Quad okay. copter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so... He's answering this app like, oh, so-and-so wants me to deliver donuts, so he yeah. does it. But in reality, he's not delivering donuts. He's sending a hole to wherever that person is to like scoop up their trash. And as you like get more and more and more, the hole gets bigger until you're swallowing like people and fireplaces now, and houses. You, you do realize how crazy this sounds when you describe this game, right? I'm like I'm nuts. I know, it sounds so <laughs> crazy. But it, but when you play this game, you see the brilliance of it. Yeah. You kind of describe this as it kind of like a reverse Katamari. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's the thing about this is that you're kind of like Katamari. You're a you're well, you don't have a hole in there, but your ball, you're essentially yeah, which you're collecting, getting bigger. Keep, yeah. keeps getting bigger until we, like houses fall in and, mm -hmm. and fences. Like mountains. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, but it's so much fun. Yeah, and what's cool about this one is it starts to add little puzzle elements to it as well. Yep. yep. There's points where you have to empty out ponds. Uh, that took me forever. Like, yeah. I was stuck. I know. And then this is going to sound even crazier. You fill your hole with water and then you take it to a bird to get rid of the water. That's, that's <laughs> the puzzle I was stuck yep. on. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually you get like catapults and trampolines and all kinds of things that yeah. you know power up your hole <laughs> <laughs> I was just, yeah I'm like okay <laughs> anyways but the writing is fantastic the story's so good yes it's totally worth the it. gameplay is is just as addictive as Katamari mm -hmm. and it's different enough to where you know, kind of like what you said it's it's its own thing like yeah. it, you know you can play it. and it's all not too long either no I played it all in one sitting yeah. oh did you yeah wow. okay it's like maybe addicted. yeah it's like maybe two and a half hours but any game where raccoons are trying to take over a town because they want all the trash is a game I want to play. <laughs> I just love your description of that game. It's so hilarious. All right. <laughs> okay, so moving on to my game here is a game that some of you might have heard of. Uh, I, I just recently discovered it on the Switch. I hadn't played it on any other systems. That is Unravel 2. Mm -hmm. And they spell 2, T-W-O. And the reason for that is because, unlike the original game, this one adds a cooperative element to it. Now, you don't have to play this game cooperative. You can play it single player. However, why would you do that? Because this game is <laughs> brilliant as a co-op game. Have you played this yet? No, but it's so cute. <laughs> it is. So basically, you you play as a guy as a little ball of yarn, mm -hmm. and you have this trail behind you. And in this game, you're always connected to your partner. Well, you're almost always connected to your partner. Mm -hmm. And you end up basically, it's, it's a... It's a platforming game, beautiful graphics, but it's very puzzle based. So every single screen you're trying to figure out how to get to the, you know, the, the other side or, or figure out some mm -hmm. sort of puzzle. And it's very, it, it's so much fun. Rebecca and I were playing it last night for way too long. <laughs> it was so addictive because you, you, you basically end up working together to try to swing the partner or or you know traverse all these crazy mm -hmm. you know puzzle it's just it's awesome you guys are looking at the footage you'll you'll kind of get it but um yeah super fun and also it's a kind of game too where you can kind of screw each other over if, you, if you're not paying <laughs> attention yeah <laughs> because when they're swinging you are you are holding the rope tight oh. and you have to kind of let go <laughs> at the right moment and you might splat them in the wall or yeah fling them off, you know, some crazy direction. It's a, it's a brilliant game, so love That's it. awesome, because I really like the first one, and the, oh, okay. the graphics are beautiful. Yeah. So I can only imagine it being co-op and just amazing. Yeah, it's it's really cool, too, because it's it's kind of realistic as far as the level design goes, because you're in the forest, you're 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 at the park, um, you, you are in houses and stuff like that, but it's also very fanciful, because there's some weird kind of backstory going on. It's, it's, it's got everything. It's really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. And my next one is Gris or Gris. 
Okay. Pretty much everybody says gris, even That's though That's what it's, I was like, oh, wrong. yeah. Because <laughs> it's like gray in Spanish. That makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> but it's a platformer adventure game that is based on this girl named Gree. Hmm. And it's actually a story about loss. So when the game opens, she's like in the hands of this like statue and she's trying to call out but she can't and then it crumbles and then she's in this like colorless world. Okay. So as you're going through the game, you're actually going through the different stages of loss and grief. Hmm. And you are slowly adding colors back to the world. Oh, positivity. It's, it's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and since there's no dialogue in the game, you can basically have it be about any struggle. Oh, and you could, okay. whatever you're going through, it might match up, hmm. even though it's lost. And it does add additional gameplay elements as well. So like, there's parts where you'll get an extra power where you can turn into a block. And that actually has a really powerful scene, probably my favorite scene, huh. where you're trying to walk through a windstorm, and when you first encounter the windstorm, you can't go through it. But then once you learn the block power, hmm. you have overcome that hurdle. Hmm. And it's really beautiful. Yeah, I've seen some gameplay footage of this, and it does look really stunning. You yeah. Know? You know, this is kind of, I've said this before in other videos, I like the fact that some game developers use the medium to do things more than just, you know, shooting people or yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? It's like they're using it as an art form, almost kind of like movies to tell stories that mm -hmm. are, you know, in a very unique game kind of way. Yeah. That's cool. Definitely, because it never outwardly tells you it's about loss. Hmm. So, if, if, unless you know. Hmm. It's going to be about whatever you want it to be about. Interesting. Because there's parts where like you encounter like this big black mass that eventually becomes a bird and it hinders you on your way. And while you're trying to solve puzzles, it's being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it can like change into different shapes basically and it'll like, there's one point where you're trying to get up from the sea, the sea of black sludge. I think it's kind of like... A bunch of metaphors. Yeah. I think like. it's like when you're about to get up and then you hit that low point. Okay. And then you're trying to crawl back out, but this thing's like sucking you down and you have to like get through it. <laughs> and what's cool about this game is, you know, I don't even know if I could die during the scene. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But it felt like I could. Yeah. You know, when I'm going through it, I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> I gotta get out of here. Like... <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. It's so awesome. I'll have to check it out. The game I chose is called Valley, and Valley's on a bunch of different systems, but it just came to Switch. I checked it out. It's unlike anything I've played so far. It's so cool. So basically, it's a first person adventure exploration game. You play as an amateur explorer that basically is trying to hunt down a, a life seed. And you're not really sure in the beginning what a life seed is, hmm. but you end up in this valley and it's kind of lost. It's a lost valley. You wake up there, you don't you don't really know where you are, you stumble upon what's called a leaf. Basically, it's a mechanized suit. That, oh, cool. That, yeah, that gives you the ability to jump really far in the beginning of the game. Uh, you get to upgrade it later, you get, you get like a grappling hook, stuff like that. However, what you're really trying to do is figure out why this military base on this remote valley was trying to harvest the life seed and build weapons from it. I would also like to know the answer to that. It's so weird, right? <laughs> and get this, the, the suit allows you to take or give life. So for instance, you'll come across a tree that's dead. And if you if, if you have enough life points on your 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 person you can actually restore the, the i know that's so nice <laughs> yeah or you can also take away like for instance you can come across a an animal or whatever you can suck if you need energy you can suck mm -hmm. up its life it's a trippy game however it's super addictive it, it, actually <laughs> i will tell you of all the games that i've covered in this video mm -hmm. i kept coming back to this one because i had to know what was going to happen next um the way it works is that you're basically just kind of platforming, exploring. There's a little bit of light shooting, so to speak. Um, there's a little bit of light puzzles, but really it's all about exploration. It reminds me of a little bit of Bioshock, about how you would find those 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 lost messages where people mm, would be talking mm -hmm. about like the past. You do that a lot in this, but also uh, it reminds me a little bit of Metroid Prime in how you explore on the worlds with Samus. It's it's a really cool, weird game. So I I don't know, I liked it. So definitely check out Valley. <laughs> and next up for me is Pikuniku. I'm glad you pronounced that. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> this game is so fun. It's super like kind of happy and colorful. And I just really like the opening to this game because <laughs> you wake up in a cave and this like ghost who's a little sassy <laughs> is just like, hey, hey, like, <laughs> like, oh, get up. 
and once you get out of your little cave, because he's like, it's dangerous to go alone. Take my full moral support, because I'm a ghost and I got nothing to give you. Okay. Good luck on your adventure. <laughs> but you get out of the cave and you realize that you are this like fabled beast, because mm. you're the beast who sleeps in the mountain. Okay. So you get out and you encounter this first town, and they sell like beast merchandise. But you basically have to prove your worth to make them see that you're not the scary beast that they saw in folklore. But that's kind of where this beast thing ends. But <laughs> okay. But so in this world, <laughs> there's a big like super mega corporation that is run by the greedy Mr. Sunshine. Hmm. And his thing is to you. He thinks more of resources as wealth as instead of money. So he's tricking the population and to be like, hey, I'm just going to come and take your junk. But by junk, he means your corn or your trees. And he's like, but I'll give you free money. Is this an RPG or what is this? It's a kind of a puzzle platformer adventure game. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, but he, when he's like, free money, people are like, yeah, Mr. Sunshine's here to give us free money. And they like totally don't realize he's taking all the like the planet's natural resources. Never trust someone called Mr. Sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> Who's giving you free money. <laughs> yeah. From a corporation. <laughs> yeah. So eventually you like meet up with this like underground resistance who like sees Mr. Sunshine for what's really going on. Okay. And then you join up with them with join up with them and help them out and it's really fun. Mm. And they also have a co-op mode and there's like I think 9 levels that you can play in co-op. Mm. And this game's super like whimsical and fun and colorful, but it does have that like ooh there's this big scary looming corporation. Yeah. So it has some like big story things and you know kind of heavy ideas. Mm. But it's so stinking cute. <laughs> okay. And just remember, you are perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it means something. I know, I'm sure it does. <laughs> I have not played this game, so. All right, next up for me is a game that I reviewed a couple years ago on Steam. Uh, it's a really excellent twin stick shooter. It is called uh, Assault Android Cactus. And on Switch, they have a little plus there. So it's a game that basically got it, it got all the content from the other versions and it got a plus mode, which is basically like a, a campaign plus mode where they randomize all the different mm -hmm. levels. But uh, you guys are looking at the footage now. It is basically Smash TV, kind of arena battles, you know, kind of like it w within like uh, one screen or whatever. Oh, cool. Yeah, and it's all twin six shooters. You have two different weapons. You have basically like a heavy weapon that you can't use all the time. You are a robot cop, I believe, that basically has a little battery at the top. You need to watch your energy. Um, what's really great about it is that it's full 3D, so mm -hmm. it has beautiful graphics. And also too, the levels change as you play. So for instance, you'll be playing along and all of a sudden the lights go out. Oh. And then only, you know, only certain parts of it are lit up. And also you have to not fall off the edges. Uh, Keeps on your toes. Very much so. It's a very intense game. It's it's very challenging, but there's a lot of content here of a lot of different robots that you can unlock. It's super fun. It's got online leaderboards. It's just, it's got everything. If you like twin stick shooters, you definitely have to check this game out. I like twin stick shooters and I like robots. Oh, you would love this game. <laughs> Perfect. And next up for me is a game that many people have been waiting for to come to the Switch. Yes. And that's Cuphead. <laughs> As of this video, it had like basically just come out and Cuphead is absolutely stunning. It's based on the, I think it's called the Rubber Hose. God, I hope that's right, because that sounds ridiculous. Oh, is, is it done an <laughs> it's old cartoon? Yeah, it's a style oh, okay. of animation okay. that was used by Disney and a lot of other companies back in the like 1930s. Yeah. And it just looks absolutely beautiful. The animation style is smooth and flawless. And uh, I know that some difficulty went into that because that kind of animation style runs like way below 60 frames per second. Hmm. So to bring it up to that was its own thing. Oh, interesting. And huh. with this game, the premise is, is that you are Cuphead and Mugman or Cuphead or Mugman. But anyways, in the beginning, um, you go to this casino and you're having the time of your life. And then you end up making a deal with the devil because you think you are on a roll. <laughs> and of course, once you make a deal with the devil, you roll snake eyes. Wah, wah. <laughs> so then Cuphead and Mugman like plead and plead and plead and plead that in order to repay that debt, they have uh, made another deal with them to go around and be his debt collectors. Okay. So you're going around to these different bosses and each boss is a debtor to the devil. And if you beat the boss, then you get their soul and it'll sign the contract. Hmm. 
So you're going around, I think there's about 15 different bosses depending on how you play. And there's boss battles, but there's also run and gun levels. So where you're more like platforming and shooting and I personally find the directional shooting that you can do a little clunky. Yeah. But the animation's so good, I almost don't care. <laughs> so this game, when you mentioned it was gonna be on this list, I know this game is notoriously difficult. How did it yeah. how did it work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> so the weird thing about this game is you can play it on regular or simple, hmm. which is a little bit patronizing. <laughs> but if you play it on simple, you can't actually beat the game. Oh. You can only go so far. Oh, so maybe kind of like a training sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like yeah. a training thing. Okay. But simple is so hard. <laughs> I can't like, I, if I try playing on regular, I die like really quick. You know, it's funny because when this came out for the Xbox One, uh, a lot of people were, I mean, when they would beat it, they would post on Twitter and Facebook yeah. and be like, oh my God, I just beat this game. Like yeah. it, was, it was an achievement in their life. You know what I mean? It really is. Yeah. One thing I found about this game is I've just been playing it on simple because... Well, you, you don't learn it. That's yeah. nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's still difficult on yeah. simple. And I mean, what I liked about it is it's kind of pattern memorization. Mm -hmm. So you can replay a level and it puts you back in pretty quickly. So I didn't tend to get too frustrated. Yeah, that's nice. And if I did beat one, it felt real good. Yeah. I know this isn't a game I'm going to be able to beat, but that's okay. It's cool that they brought this to Switch. Mm -hmm. like, you know, and I think this is a, I think it's going to get a whole other audience here. I yeah. Think cool. I haven't personally played it myself. It's simply because I've heard it is really difficult and I just know for myself, I need to put the time into it to yes. really beat that. And I just haven't had the time. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe on the Switch, I'll pick it up for sure. So Yeah. And you can play it co-op. Yeah. So make it a little bit easier with a friend. Not That's that cool. much easier. We'll have to try that. Maybe they're just in your way. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have friendly fire? We'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's super beautiful. And if this is a game you've been, you know, waiting on, because maybe you don't have an Xbox One, mm. maybe now's the time to get it. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, next up for me is a game, uh, Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. Now, this is a game that's been out for a couple years because it originally came out, I believe I have it on the 3DS. And the, the Shantae games... For, the first thing is that it was a it was kind of a dormant 2D platforming series mm -hmm. back on, I believe, the Game Boy Color or something like that. It yeah, was, long, it was time a long, ago. long time ago. And then Way Forward basically brought it back. And this is the third game in the series. And it's just classic 2D 16 bit graphics, uh, platforming. It's got puzzle aspects of it. It's a little bit kind of like Metroid in that you, you, you do a little bit of backtracking. You have to mm -hmm. kind of upgrade sometimes to either find hidden areas or, you know, get to where you need to go. Um, I adore the main character. Mm -hmm. uh, she's so feisty, so funny. I like the fact she uses her hair to, to whip. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I wish I could do that. I know, me too. <laughs> like, I'm growing it out. I, let's use it as a weapon. <laughs> No, but it, it's a it's a game that a lot of people are familiar with. Maybe you don't realize it's on the Switch, or you don't realize that it's you know basically under twenty dollars. Or mm -hmm. I forget what what the price is exactly. It might be exactly at twenty dollars, but it's a classic for a reason. It's really well made. Way Forward make excellent games. They always have yeah. in, in my book. So it's it's almost it's just a no brainer. Just go check it out. And they're on a roll with the Shantae games. I know, <laughs> I know. It, actually, yeah. I mean, they they put out another one. I forget what that one's called. Uh, a Half Genie... Half Genie Hero? Yes. And then also, um, I think they're going to kickstart a fifth one or something. Nice! Like I know. So, yeah. Very cool series. Definitely check it out. And next up for me is The Red Strings Club. And so this is a cyberpunk adventure game. And it's sort of a visual novel-ish. And you might notice that we might be pixelating some stuff in the gameplay footage. Yes. And <laughs> you, you warned me ahead of time. And yeah. so the, the pixelate tool in... And my video editor is going, yeah, full time. Yeah, here. it's going to good use. <laughs> yes. This game is pretty M rated. Okay. It's got a lot of swearing, a lot of nudity. Ooh. But, I mean, when you're set in like a cyberpunk, not really post apocalyptic, but kind of that kind of world, you're going to be swearing a lot. It's true. <laughs> it's set in a world where there's like kind of a mega corporation that supplies these implants that people can use. And people are all about them because you can enhance your physical appearance or, you know, make yourself more persuasive in business meetings or make yourself famous online. Like, hmm. you can do all kinds of things with these implants, so why wouldn't you? <laughs> okay. But one person who didn't is the bartender named Donovan. And he's the one you play as for most of the game. And he's also an information broker, which is a great job 
for a bartender because people tell you all kinds of things, especially when they got drinks in them. And he's a very special kind of bartender because his drinks can play off people's emotions. Hmm. So you can mix drinks that'll play off, like, for example, lust or depression, anxiety, madness. Like you can play off all these different emotions in order to get different reactions out of people, which will yield you different information. Hmm. So it's a really handy skill to have if you're trying to get information out of people about this mega corporation. Huh. Because like part of this game is that there's of course this mega corporation. And so of course there's the like resistance mm -hmm. who are against said mega corporation. <laughs> So, I mean, that's basically what it's about, is kind of figuring out what their secrets are. Are they unveiling this new thing that's going to destroy the humanity? Who knows? They're a mega corporation. <laughs> that's all they do. That's all they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, it's so funny that you brought up this game because my last game is also a visual novel mm -hmm. that is cyberpunk <laughs> and you play as a bartender it's oh so what funny. are the chances i know it's so funny <laughs> but i originally saw valhalla at pax a couple years ago and i saw its art style and i talked to the developer and i was like sold so so your game is very m-rated mine's mm -hmm. a little bit more pg-13 mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that, yeah. you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> but uh, you'll see more footage of mine here. But basically, yeah, you play as a bartender, and you kind of hinted at this, that the, the brilliant thing about a game that is story-driven that pl has you playing as a bartender is that mm -hmm. there's so many different characters go to a bar, yep. get drunk, and tell their story. Mm -hmm. And it's just a... You know, it, it's a mix of every kind of character, and this game is all about characters. So, I want to say right off the bat, I've tried playing visual novels in the past. Mm -hmm. I and, have as well. Yeah, and I always get bored. I always feel like I'm clicking the, the next button. Yep. You know what I mean? It's like the dialogue is taking too long. It's, I don't care what they're saying. Get to the point. Get to, you know, keep moving the story along. With Valhalla, it's the first visual novel game I've ever played where I was just riveted. Every character, the, the dialogue, I was sitting there going, can you say that in video games? Like it was crazy stuff. It was so much fun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's it's from the whimsical to the really kind of heartbreaking, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so well written. So I've been really impressed with Valhalla. I think you guys will too. It's a, it's a really special game. Again, if you hate visual novels, or you haven't liked them in the past, give it a try. So that's another 10 games that are really fun to play on the Switch that are 20 bucks or under. Mm -hmm. And you may have noticed this is sort of like part two to a video we've already done. But I mean, the Switch seems to have like endless under $20 fantastic games. Oh, I know. It's funny because if I don't pick up my Switch for like a week or two and I go back into the, the eShop, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God, you're just like scrolling forever. It's, it's really well supported by mm -hmm. both big publishers, indie developers. It's, it's awesome, it's yeah. awesome. So we love to know down in the comments if there are other games, which we know there are, that yeah. you would like to see <laughs> in upcoming videos. Let us know because obviously we're big fans and mm -hmm. we'll probably download them actually. Yeah. <laughs> so where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me at Kinzilla, K-N-S-Z-I-L-L-A on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Yay, all right. Thanks very much for watching guys. Thank you for subscribing, take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here. So we're at a very interesting point in the life cycle of the Nintendo Switch because it's been out long enough that there's a decent amount of games out there that you can now get for, you know, $20 or less. And so in this video, I'm gonna share with you 10 Nintendo Switch games that you can pretty much find for $20 or less. And often they are in physical releases, although obviously sometimes you can get even better deals if you're willing to go digitally. All right, let's take a look. We're gonna start with a game called Battle Chasers Night War. Now I wanna be clear, this game is not exclusive to the Switch. It's also available, I believe on the PC, PS4, uh, and also the Xbox One. But as you guys know, one of the big benefits of getting the Switch version is that you can play it portably. And so that's what a lot of these games are gonna be. This is a turn-based RPG based on a popular comic series. And in this game, you play as a group of adventurers that are trapped on this mysterious island. And then you go about interacting with some of the locals. You're trying to find out who the big baddie is. And ultimately, you're just trying to get off of this island. And the game has you traversing the overworld map to basically advance the story. There's also some combat there as well, some 
some enemies get in your way and you'll, you'll jump into a turn-based battle, which is going to feel very familiar to fans of, you know, the 16-bit and 32-bit turn-based style, that sort of Final Fantasy style of combat. But then the game will zoom in to some of the dungeon-like areas. And this is where it becomes a little bit more Diablo-like, where it's an isometric view. And you do a little bit more of exploring, a little bit more puzzle solving, things like that. But as you see here, it's got some really great visuals and also some fantastic voice acting. And this is not a short game by any means. It's actually fairly long. It's gonna take you up to 30 hours to complete. So this is a very cool RPG, especially if you like turn-based combat. So definitely check it out. Next up is a game I never expected to see released on the Switch. That of course is the wonderful 101. So this game was originally released back in 2013 on the Nintendo Wii U, and it was developed by Platinum Games. They are the creator of the amazing Bayonetta series, as well as Nier Automata and also Astral Chain, among many more. And unfortunately, at the time, it was considered somewhat of a sales disappointment on the Wii U. So this was an attempt to you know, try to find a new audience for it on the Switch. The premise of this game is that you are one of 101 superheroes that can unite to create this kind of morph that can happen when there is a big group of you and create these kind of uber weapons to either give you an advantage in battle or help you solve puzzles or maybe even get through the level itself. And you do that by drawing certain shapes and letters. Now, you originally did this on the Wii U touchpad, but it also supports the analog stick. Although, in my opinion, it doesn't work quite as well. And on the Switch, these controls have been, they've been translated over to the Switch fairly well. Although, again, I'm not really a fan of using the thumbstick. I think playing this in portable mode using the touchscreen is by far the better way to go. That said, this is an incredibly hectic and hyperactive game that frankly just never lets up on the action for very long. And it's got some hilarious characters and presentation. It just doesn't take itself very seriously at all and definitely has some huge laughs in the story. So I'm very happy to see that it was brought over to the Switch and given an additional extra life. Next up is a game that is a bit of a surprise. It's called John Wick Hex. And this game basically serves up as a prequel to the movie series. And I absolutely love these movies. And in this game, you also play as John Wick. But what's really cool about this game is that it takes those kind of crazy choreographed shootouts from the movies and then slows them down to a turn-based strategic combat. In every turn, you can move John, reload your weapon, you can heal yourself, you can refocus your energy, or you can engage in combat. And you can do that either hand-to-hand -hand or with a weapon. And I've seen a lot of people compare this to games like, say, XCOM. And yeah, that's pretty accurate. Although this, this I think, feels like it goes faster than that, which is kind of you know on par with the movies as well. And so, yes, it's similar to the turn-based kind of combat and movement in XCOM, but it also has its own kind of vibe. And as a nice little touch that once you complete a level, you can then rewatch the entire level in real time, almost like it was a scene from the movies. It's, it's really cool. Next up is a game I'm very excited to talk about. It is Star Wars Pinball, and it's made by Zen Studios, which is a company that knows a thing or two about video pinball. They've made dozens of great tables for a lot of licensed companies, including Marvel, Williams, uh, they've done Jurassic Park tables, Walking Dead, Aliens, Bethesda, and just a ton more. And this is a great collection because it comes with 19 tables covering most of the movies. Plus it's got some TV shows thrown in there like Clone Wars and also Star Wars Rebels. And they've even got some really cool theme tables in there that are dedicated to things like TIE Fighter versus Star Fighters, uh, Jedi versus Sith, and a bunch more. Oh yeah, and it even supports the flip grip so you can play the game in vertical mode. That's awesome. So if you like Star Wars and you like pinball, this is a must buy. Next up is a title that maybe you haven't heard of before that is Kaze and the Wild Masks. So this is 100% a 90s style 2D platforming game in the best possible way. 
In this game, you play as Kaze, who's trying to save her friend from a curse, and it spans over 30 levels, and it has an additional 50 bonus levels. So there's a lot of content here. And as you progress through the game, you acquire these wild masks, which give you additional powers from like say a lizard or a shark, a tiger, or even an eagle. And that kind of helps break up the gameplay and keep it interesting. And as you can see by this gameplay footage, it's just a truly beautiful pixel art game. And it also has some really solid controls and gameplay to boot. It's also not too long either. It clocks in around six hours to complete, which means it doesn't overstay its welcome. Now I get that there have been a ton of these type of games released over the last couple of years, but this really is a fun one. And I love the fact that it got a physical release. And like I said, for the most part, you can get it for 20 bucks or less. All right, next up I have two games. I have Darksiders 2 and 3. And you know, these games have been released on many different systems over the years. As a matter of fact, all three Darksiders games have been released on the Switch. However, the original Darksiders is a little bit over 20 bucks, so I wasn't gonna focus on that. Instead, I'm gonna highlight the second and third game, which is fine because, well, technically the second game is considered probably the best in the series, and when you can get it for under 20 bucks and physical, yeah, that rocks. Now, if you're not familiar with these games, they're basically action adventure games where you control Death, who is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And in this game, you're trying to clear your brother's reputation. He's been accused of a crime. And in doing so, you're also trying to resurrect humanity by traveling to the, the tree of life. So that's the plot of this game. It's not exactly the most original game. It may sound a little bit familiar, but that's okay because it's got it where it counts, the gameplay. And speaking of which, these games definitely play very similar to the early God of War games, where you do a lot of fighting, kind of hack and slash style, but there's also a good amount of platforming and sort of puzzle solving, things like that. Plus you've got the edgy characters and plot. Now, I do like this game though, because it's got some really great character designs, especially your main character, Death. He just looks badass. It's also got some great voice acting and some pretty decent graphics, especially, you know, on the Switch, right? The Switch isn't exactly that powerful. You can definitely tell this is a triple A title with some money and development behind it. And it's decently long too, at around 20 hours to complete the main story. And what of war? Would you kill your brother to save your precious balance? He is innocent. Are you so certain? Next up is a game that I was very excited to see was getting a remastered version that of course is Destroy All Humans. I originally played the first game back on the PlayStation 2 and I really loved it. But uh, this is an HD remake of that original game designed for modern consoles with a little bit better graphics as well as some motion capture for the characters during the cutscenes. So you'll notice a bit of a bump there in quality. And while the graphic updates are nice, the heart of this game is still a ton of fun. So in this game, you play as Crypto 137, which is an alien with a bad attitude that arrives on Earth basically during the 1950s. And his goal is to harvest human DNA that is needed to keep a species alive. So you're kind of playing the bad guy here, which is really fun. Now this is mostly an open world game that allows you to solve puzzles kind of however you want. You do a mix of using your alien weaponry as well as some of your psychic abilities. And it gives you a lot of tools to mess around with, including the ability to read minds. You can also disguise yourself as other humans so that you can blend in with them. Uh, you can levitate and pick up objects and a lot more. However, probably my favorite thing in this game is to hop into your spaceship cruise around and just blow everything up in sight. That never gets old. Now, it's not a perfect game, but it's certainly fun and very memorable. It's hilarious. And honestly, for 20 bucks or less, yeah, you should definitely check it out. Next up is the Bioshock Collection. And this has a little bit of a caveat here. So basically it contains all three Bioshock games in this one collection. However, it's important to note that that game card is only 16 gigabytes in size, meaning that you have to still download another 30 gigabytes once you put it into your Switch. I know, that's incredibly annoying, but I just need to point it out. That said, when I first bought this, I was originally blown away that I was able to play these games portably, like on the Switch. It was, it was amazing. 
Also, they include in here all of the DLC, which at the time was considered some of the best DLC missions released pretty much for any game. And is certainly worth playing because they definitely tie into the main story in really cool ways. And when I got this, I went back and replayed Bioshock Infinite on the Switch. And again, I was blown away just how well it runs on the handheld. I mean, it was a joy to revisit. And again, there's just a ton of content included here. So with these collections, you're looking at over 40 hours of gameplay. So yes, it's annoying that not all the content is actually on that game card, but at, you know, 20 bucks or less, I do think it's still a good deal. All right, next up, you know me, I gotta have a racing game in here and Need for Speed Hot Pursuit is a good one. Again, another surprise when this was initially announced because typically EA does not go back and remaster many of these Need for Speed games. But what's cool is that this is considered by many, myself included, one of the last truly great Need for Speed games. So I'm so happy that they remastered this and brought it to modern consoles. And one of the reasons why this game is so good is because it was created by Criterion Games, which you will recognize as the makers of the Burnout series. And because of that, this definitely has a bit of a more arcadey feel to it than some of the newer kind of simulation style Need for Speed games. I also like how the locations and tracks are based on West Coast states like Washington, Oregon, and California which I'm very familiar with, and it definitely gives it a lot of variety in those levels and the racing challenges. Another thing I like about this game is that the developer doesn't try to just wedge in some cheesy story into it. I mean, this is all about racing, both from the street racer perspective and also the police officer. That's it. And so I'm kind of hoping this game did fairly well because it would be cool for EA to go back and maybe try to remaster some of the other Need for Speed games. What do you think? And next up, another controversial one, especially on the Switch, that is Resident Evil, the Origins Collection. So let's talk about the positives here. So they take the original Resident Evil HD as well as Resident Evil Zero HD from the GameCube, and then they're bringing it over to the Switch. That's the good thing. Sadly though, only Resident Evil Zero is actually on that game card. So you'll need to download Resident Evil HD if you wanna play that game. That is annoying as hell. And at the time, if I remember right, this game was sold full retail at $60, which rubbed a lot of Resident Evil fans the wrong way. You know, especially when you consider that one of the games isn't even on the card. And I guess that's why now, because you can get it at under $20, I feel like it's a good option if you wanna play these games portably on the Switch. And you can do what I did, which was pick up the PS4 version, which has both games on a disc and is also under, you know, 20 bucks. So it's, it's not great. I hate it when companies do this. I wish they would just pay the little extra to get all the content on that actual card. Don't require downloads, but it is what it is. These are really fun to play. Um, they look great. There is some long load times, which is kind of annoying. So it's not a perfect collection, but again, when it's cheap, you can kind of make the call there. So anyways, guys, that is 10 Nintendo Switch games that you can find typically for $20 or less. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here. Now today I wanna to share with you some Nintendo Switch hidden gems that I found in the eShop. Now there are a ton of games being released in the eShop and it's easy to miss them. So let's take a look. We're gonna start off with a nice little time waster called Atomic Run Gun Jump Gun. That is such a funny subtitle because it perfectly fits this little game. This game is the epitome of a game that is just one more try. Where basically you keep dying and dying as you, you basically feel like it's impossible to get through these tough levels, but then you just magically do it and it feels awesome. I also really dig it's kind of cool retro pixel art style graphics. It just fits perfectly. Plus this game is surprisingly funny. Between each level, there is a guy that will talk to you and they just say the weirdest stuff. I mean, usually you skip by that stuff, but in this game you actually want to read it because it'll make you laugh. 
And as you can tell by this footage, I am dying all over the place, but the game is super fun, so definitely check it out. This next game is called Earthlock, and it might look kind of familiar to some of you who have played this on other systems. That's because this game originally came out as Earthlock Festival of Magic on PC and also consoles like the Xbox One and also the PlayStation 4. However, when the game originally came out, it got mediocre reviews, and the developer at the time was actually working on the sequel, but they stopped and took all that criticism to heart and put the sequel on hold and then they dedicated over a year of time to fix almost everything that people didn't like about it. And so that's the version of the game that we get on the Switch, which probably should have been the original version all along, but again, they had an extra year of development to really polish it. For instance, they added more memorable characters, also wittier and kind of more personable dialogue for all the different characters in the game. They added side quests, also hidden bosses, and a bunch of other little tweaks that they list on their website. But basically this is a throwback to say the PlayStation 1 era of JRPGs. And what I mean by that is that, you know, in addition to turn-based combat, this also has crafting, gardening, a bunch of stuff like that. Now that said, I don't think this game is perfect or frankly that memorable, but it is a really solid and fun JRPG. So if you're missing those classic role-playing games from like say the N64 era, well then definitely check this out. Lately I've been playing an awful lot of a game called Skies of Fury DX. And as you can see here, it is a World War I style arcade aerial dogfighting game that's really well made. Now, right off the bat, I wanna mention that this used to be a mobile free to play game that you would play on your smartphone. But thankfully, all of that stuff has been stripped out and what you get is a fully functional, frankly, pretty large game. For instance, you can play as either the Germans or the Allies and there are over a hundred campaign missions to keep you busy for a while. There's also four player split screen multiplayer dogfights, which is pretty awesome. There's tons of unlockables too, to keep you playing the game, including upgrades for your aircraft, both in performance, but also in the way it looks. Now I spent most of my time playing the single player campaign. And what you do in that is kind of what you do in a lot of these games where you do deathmatch, aerial, dogfighting, taking down waves and waves of enemies. There's also escort missions and also time trial through optical courses. All told, if you miss games like Red Baron or even Crimson Skies, well, definitely check this out. I do love my racing games, so I had to include Mantis Burn Racing on the Switch. Now, originally this was released on the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, but the Switch version is the complete package with all of the DLC included. But even more than that, I've read that some of the reviews of the Xbox One and PS4 versions, people were getting kind of inconsistent frame rates. And that is something I did not experience on the Switch. I mean, it feels like it's pushing close to 60 frames a second, although it's definitely dropping depending on how many AI cars are on the screen. But it's always playable. I mean, I, I didn't notice hardly at all. Now, as for the game itself, as you can see here, it is a top-down arcade racing game. Now, this is very simple to play, but pretty tough to master as races get faster and faster as you progress and upgrade your car. Also, I found that the computer AI is no slouch. They keep you on your toes through the entire game. Also, you'll notice that drifting is a big part of this game. So knowing when to drift and also when to boost is key to your success. I also think that the tracks and environments look pretty cool. I mean, it's a nice looking game. Although that said, it doesn't seem like there are a ton of tracks in the game and you end up going through them forward and reverse, which is a little bit disappointing. The game also supports classic couch style split screen up to four players. And you can go online to race up to eight players and it supports cross network play. Very cool. 
Next up is a game called Breck Forcist Battle. Now this is a mix of classic Breakout with a little bit of Arkanoid thrown in and then obviously a very Japanese aesthetic. And just like those other games, you control the paddle at the bottom and try not to let the ball get past you. Although, as you can see, this one is based on food or specifically breakfast, because why not? I think what kind of sets this game apart is that obviously you don't want the ball to get past you, but really it's focusing on combos and then keeping them going through the use of the power-ups. Now I have to say this game gets incredibly hectic as it moves along because often I would lose track of that ball amidst all this flying debris. That said, this is a fun and enjoyable take on that classic breakout style gameplay. It's not gonna change your world or anything, but this is a fun little time waster when you're on the go. Next up is a game called Kona. Now, some people have called this a walking simulator, but I actually think it's a bit more than that. Unlike other walking simulator games that I've played, this one has a bit more adventure style gameplay than most. Played entirely in the first person, you are up in the coldest parts of Canada trying to solve a murder mystery and how it relates to the strange people who live in the area. Now, I would describe this game as a mix of, say, film noir mixed in with a little bit of local Canadian folklore and then also a tad bit of survival horror as well. In this game, you do a lot of reading of notes and messages left behind, primarily in creepy empty sheds and also abandoned homes and businesses. I like playing these games every once in a while because they're a nice break from the typical action heavy games I normally play. So if you're looking for a game that has an intriguing story as well as a touch of detective work, well definitely check it out. Toki Tori, oh yes, a puzzle game with platforming elements. Now, this is gonna be familiar to some of you because sequels have come out recently in the last couple of years. However, this is the original version. You can call this kind of like a remaster or a reboot. It originally came out on the Game Boy Color. So yes, this is a remake of the original Game Boy Color version with obviously a new coat of paint. In this puzzle game, you play as a young chick trying to rescue your siblings that are still in eggs hidden all around the level. And to help you do that, you have tools to get through the level, including the ability to build bridges, also warp to other levels, freeze enemies, and more. But the trick to this game is that you can only use those tools a set number of times. Now, if you use them incorrectly or at the wrong moment, well, the puzzle is unsolvable. But thankfully, you have the ability to rewind time and try and try again. This game is a bit of a mind bender, and honestly, I find it to be very tough. Maybe because I'm not the smartest guy. <laughs> but when I would solve it, it would feel awesome. So if you love puzzle games that are going to work your brain, definitely check it out. Next up is Aqua Kitty UDX. This game is going to feel very similar to fans of Defender. Do you remember playing Defender back in the 80s at the arcade? Oh man, I certainly do. And this is a really cool clone. And like Defender, this game is a shooter where you move your ship side to side, using the left and right bumpers to change the direction you're facing. In the midst of all the shooting, you have to keep an eye on that mini map up at the top there because that is tracking where the enemies are, but more importantly, also where your cat friends are possibly being abducted. So just like in Defender, every once in a while, you'll hear a cat cry out, and that means they're being abducted and taken to the surface. That means you gotta rush over there and try to save them as quickly as possible. New to the Switch version is a brand new Dreadnought boss mode as well. Aqua Kitty UDX is a really fun, classic style shooter game. If you like Defender, definitely check it out. So that's some of the games I've been playing on my Switch, but I would love to know what you guys recommend I pick up next. Please post a comment down below. As always, I wanna thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Middle Jesus here. And now that the Switch has been out for a couple years, I thought it might be a good time to take a look at eight Switch racing games that you may have missed. This is gonna be a mix of new games as well as games that have been out for a while. And maybe those older games got updates that uh, you wanna pay attention to now. So let's take a look. So the first game I wanna talk about, you see it here, it's called Overlanders. And this is by a company called Rundown Games. 
And as you can see by the gameplay footage here, it is a racing game that is inspired very much so by Star Wars Pod Racer. Although I have to be honest, this is a little bit tougher, so be warned. And the reason why I say it feels like Pod Racer is because the controls feel very similar to that game where you have the dual analog sticks to help you control, make those really tight corners. Plus it has that kind of slippery vibe that you're used to in that arcade game. And like in Pod Racer, you have weapons and power-ups to boost your vehicle so you get better over time. One really cool aspect of this game is a race where you and your competitors are actually trying to take down this charging beast that is running in front of you. The game calls it a monster hunt, and that's exactly what it is. So in addition to trying to race and not crash into stuff, you're also trying to get close enough to that beast to try to take him down. It's actually a pretty fun mode that I was really surprised to see here. Now overall, I think this game runs really well and it has pretty good graphics as you can see here. Although there are some spots, especially when you're starting a race where the textures kind of pop in as they're loading. So this game's a little rough around the edges. Just kind of keep that in mind. It's also currently only digital, so there's no physical version of this yet, but I do think it's a surprisingly fun game. It's not perfect, but if you miss playing a new pod racing game, well, definitely check it out. The next game I want to mention is one that you may be familiar with if you played it on mobile, and that is Asphalt 9 Legends by Gameloft. Now, the reason I want to mention it here is because some people may not realize it actually got released on the Switch, and the release is kind of interesting. This game is primarily known as a free-to-play game, and when it was brought over to the Switch, it's still available for you to check out for free, and you can play it that way. However, you can also pay the $20, which is what I did, and basically get access to almost everything that you would ever need. Now, because I'd already played this game on mobile, I knew I was gonna enjoy it on Switch, so I just went ahead and bought the Starting Racer bundle for 20 bucks, which basically gives you blueprints to unlock a bunch of the more advanced cars right off the bat. It also gives you 200,000 credits to apply to upgrades that you, know, you would normally have to grind for, so you don't have to do that, as well as 300 tokens. And if you're not familiar with this series, it's a really cool mix of, say, Burnout and Ridge Racer because the speed is there, the crashes are there, as well as how the levels are designed. But really for me, what I love about this game that it does almost better than any other is the drifting. You see, there are a lot of arcade games that include drifting, and some of them do it better than others. Obviously, I mentioned Ridge Racer, which is probably the king of drifting in these games, but I always have this learning curve that I have to kind of fight through to really control the car through turns. You know, drifting is something that's kind of unnatural to do in some of these games, but in my opinion, actually, Asphalt 9 is one of the best examples of drifting because it's so easy to get into and you master it after basically just one race. And I think the reason why it does it so well is because it doesn't even attempt to try to be realistic in any way. So I just really appreciate the speed of this game. The graphics, as you can tell, are really great on Switch. Uh, the controls, just the energy and the excitement of this game, it's, it's pretty awesome. I think one of the downsides to this game is that the free-to-play interface is still included in the game, and as you can see here, it's very cluttered. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's somewhat confusing, but again, thankfully, if you don't want to worry about that, you can just drop the money in the beginning, just buy it for 20 bucks, or maybe even get lucky and get it on sale. I'm definitely glad that the Asphalt series has been brought over to the Switch with a lot of that free-to-play stuff you know, stripped out or at least optional because underneath it all, there is a really solid and really well-made arcade racing game that definitely deserves to be played. Next up is Nickelodeon Kart Racers. As you guys can see by the footage here, this is obviously inspired by some of the classic kart racing games like Mario Kart as well as Crash Bandicoot. And as you would expect, you can play as several Nickelodeon characters, including my favorites. When I saw them on the cover, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to play as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, one thing I want to mention is that there are several difficulty settings and the game defaults to beginner, which if you look at this footage, it might seem kind of slow, especially 
if you've been playing these kind of games for a long time. It wasn't until I went into the menu and increased the difficulty, I was like, oh, okay, that's how it speeds up the game, which then started to feel more natural. But it is nice that they include the beginner mode here if you're new to these kind of racing games. Now, being that this is a Nickelodeon game, of course, Slime is gonna play a role in it. And the way it works here is that Slime actually builds up boost. And so you wanna drive over it as much as possible. And what's funny is because when I first started playing this game, I was so used to trying to avoid things like, you know, oil slicks that originally I was just, I, I avoided them, which is the, the totally wrong thing that you would want to do. And what's cool is that some levels have you racing in rivers of slime that then starts to feel very similar to like, say the Sonic All-Stars racing, where now you're kind of on a boat-like device and it kind of changes up the way that it controls and you know mixes the game up nicely. Now, if you do extremely well in a race, you might earn a victory lap, which is basically a minute of you on the track alone, trying to collect as many coins and mystery boxes as possible which in then turn will give you some random loot that you can then use to get new paint you know, schemes or upgrades and more money. And I gotta say, the level design in this is really well done. As you can see by this footage here, they're very colorful, uh, very fun to explore, sometimes almost overwhelmingly, kind of like Mario Kart where you get distracted by all the stuff in the background. But again, something I was really surprised with, this looks like it might be a budget title, but it doesn't, doesn't look like it, doesn't feel like it. So I guess I would say that this is a pretty well-made kart racing game on the Switch. It's way better than you would think. So if you're into kart racing games, you've already played some of the big name ones like the Mario Karts and stuff like that, definitely check this out. Here's a game that I've talked about before, but I wanna bring it up here again, because again, the Switch version is so great. And that of course is Riptide GP Renegade. Now, if this kind of game looks sort of familiar, well, it's probably because this was made by the excellent programmers over at Vector Unit. Now, they have some of the same people who also worked on some of the Hydro Thunder games. And honestly, this is one of the best arcade racing games, I think, in the last several years. And this game definitely follows in the Hydro Thunder's footsteps where you're racing on water, you're doing tricks for boost, as well as you can upgrade your vehicle and fully customize it. And this is a really nice looking game, both in its level design, as well as the water effects. Those water effects there, they're just top notch. And I like how the level designs are very fantastical, like they were in Hydro Thunder, where it's kind of futuristic. You're not exactly sure what's going on, but it's a cool place to, to race through. The trick system is surprisingly deep and something you're definitely gonna wanna spend some time mastering because like other games like Splashdown or SSX Tricky, you're gonna wanna do that because if you land the trick, you can get boost, which is essential to winning races. One hint I would give you if you're playing this game and you're getting stuck is that upgrades definitely matter in this game because if you're struggling to get first place and unlock the next level, well, it's most likely because you need to upgrade your vehicle or perhaps maybe unlock a better one. So sometimes you end up having to replay previous levels that you've already beaten just to get more money so that way you can get the next vehicle. I tell you what though, I play this game on multiple systems now and I definitely consider it a modern racing classic. I'd love to see them do a sequel. Here are some racing games that some of you might already be familiar with. That of course is Gear Club Unlimited 1 and 2. But what you may not know is that they also released a Porsche expansion to the second game. And that expansion includes a new seasonal game mode as well as three new championships. It also comes with a bunch of new Porsches that you can unlock as well as a legendary Porsche that you can win as a trophy. But really that's just adding to a series of games that are already rock solid on the Switch. Now, if you've never played the Gear Club Unlimited games on Switch, well, as you can see here, they're very much inspired by the Forza series. And actually, when the first game came out on Switch, it was filling a need that I felt was sorely missing on Switch because, you know, there were a couple arcade racing games, but nothing like this, nothing where they took, you know, realistic graphics with real cars in kind of realistic scenarios. And, uh, you know, it filled that void very well. 
its two big features are very similar to Forza. For instance, this line here on the road, now you can toggle that if you don't like it, but basically that's giving you real-time feedback as to the best line that you should be taking around corners, as well as you know telling you if you're going too fast or not. And the other feature that's really handy is a rewind time feature. So anytime that you screw up on a corner or maybe you hit a car and you just wanna do a do-over, well, you can hold down a button, back up time to right before you screwed up and then take another run at it. And there doesn't seem to be any penalty in using that feature. So use it as much as you want. It's a great feature to have in the game. One of the biggest complaints against this series, and I would probably agree, is that they tend to be a little bit on the bland side. Now, don't get me wrong, the graphics, the cars, the controls, the racing, everything feels great, but there's no soul to this game. It feels very empty and very cold. Now, they do have some talking heads, these little you know, line-drawn characters here, but honestly, you just kind of skip past it. You don't care. So it would be cool if in the next game in the series, if they would look towards Forza Horizon or you know, even the Need for Speed series and just put a little bit more personality into it. I think that would go a long ways into making these just a little bit more popular. Now, I do want to mention something, and that is if you're like me and you like to collect the physical versions of these games, well, don't be tricked by this case because I actually bought this at a GameStop and I assumed that the Porsche stuff was going to be on the cartridge and it is not. It's actually a download code in there. So. Just be aware, a bit of a bummer, but it's still a really fun game. Here is Horizon Chase Turbo, another racing game that I've talked about on my channel previously. But the reason why I want to bring it up here in this video is because since the making of that one, they've actually released two big updates that I think are worth talking about. Now, if you're not familiar with this game, well, you are in luck because as you can tell by this footage here, this has a great old school vibe to it really tight controls and just over the top speed. I definitely like the art style in this game. It's both a throwback to those classic Super Nintendo Genesis games, but it's also somewhat modern looking. And there is already a ton of content included on the retail release. There's a ton of races and tracks to explore. As a matter of fact, there's an entire world that you scroll around and you can just travel from country to country, city to city. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of reasons to go back and replay this game and try to get gold medals in every single location. And one of the things that really sets this game apart to me is that you have to pay attention to your fuel, which is very old school feeling because as you race, your fuel is slowly going down and you can barely lose a race if you don't pay attention and refuel. Now you'll see little fuel cans on the track. And so again, don't ignore those, you have to pick them up. And the developer continues to support this game. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the free DLC that you can download that adds a beginner mode. Now this is really nice if maybe you're new to this style of arcade racing game, or maybe you're just a casual player, download the beginner mode and check it out. I mean, again, it's free. And then for only $2, they release this DLC called Summer Vibes, which is basically a love letter to OutRun. In that DLC, you get a new exclusive car, which is a tribute to the classic convertible Ferrari that you would drive in OutRun. Also, they took 12 roads out of the main campaign and then redesigned them for kind of a summer vibe. And then finally, they strung them all together so you could technically drive from coast to coast, kind of like on your own mini vacation. So yeah, Horizon Chase Turbo was already a really fun arcade racing game that they made even better with that DLC. If you haven't played it, definitely check it out. And then there's two games here at the end that I wanna mention, more as honorable mentions, and the first one being Fast RMX. Now this game is gonna be very familiar to people who bought a Switch at launch because this was a launch title. And it came out at a time when there really wasn't a lot of arcade racing games. And this one just blew people's minds. This game is excellent. But I wanted to mention this game because if you came to Switch a little bit late, well, you may have missed this title because now there's a ton of games in the eShop to choose from. As you can see by this footage, Fast RMX is obviously inspired by F-Zero as well as the Wipeout series. It's got that futuristic design. It's got that insane sense of speed and really tight controls. 
This game introduced this really cool phase shifting mechanic where at the push of a button you can switch between either yellow or blue phase, which will give you a boost depending on if you match the color that is on the track. In the beginning of this game, that's somewhat optional, but as the tracks get more and more complex and the games get faster and there's bigger jumps and tougher computer racers to go against, well, you're definitely gonna wanna master that phase ability. And then there's the game Grip, which I've talked about on my channel before. It's come out on the Switch, but you can also get it on other consoles as well. And this is basically a spiritual sequel to the PlayStation 1 classic Roll Cage. Now the premise of this game and the reason why it's called Grip is because your futuristic vehicle doesn't really have any up or down and the tracks are designed to take advantage of that. What that means is that during a race you'll be on the ground but then all of a sudden you'll find yourself on the ceiling, you'll find yourself on the sides. It's absolute madness. There really isn't any right way to go through these tracks and it becomes chaos at times. Now, admittedly, this was originally released in somewhat of a rough state that kind of disappointed some fans of the original game, but the developers have patched and updated this quite a bit based on community feedback. It's not a perfect game, but it is a pretty fun arcade racing game, and I go back to it time and time again. All right, guys, well, that's a quick look at eight Switch games that I feel like should not be missed, but there are a bunch of other games that I could have mentioned. So I would love to know what games you think that I should check out as well as others who are watching this video. Please post a comment below because as you guys know, the eShop is filled with games and sometimes it's hard to find the good stuff. All right guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here and I am back with another Switch video. Thought it might be kind of fun to show you some of the games I have been playing on my Switch lately. And this video is gonna be a mix of physical releases as well as digital. And I'm gonna have a racing game in here, shooters, got some run and guns, also adventure games. So let's take a look. The first one here is called Rise Race the Future. Now, at first glance, this may look like yet another, you know, Wipeout or Ridge Racer style game. But really, in my mind, this plays more like a futuristic Sega Rally game. One of its cool mechanics is that it has you switching between driving on roads and also on water. So the, the tires actually retract whenever you hit water, almost kind of like the DeLorean in Back to the Future. And that really changes up the driving mechanic a lot, meaning that when you're on water, it plays more like you're on a boat than a car. Another game that did that really well was Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. Remember that game? Like the Sega Rally games, the steering has you sliding around corners and managing your brakes more than you would in, say, other arcade racing games. It's, I guess it's part simulation, but it's also very arcade. And the computer-controlled opponents can be uh, kind of punishing, especially in the beginning when you're learning the game, but Thankfully, every once in a while, the AI will screw up, which is nice. There's a couple different modes to play in this game, including challenges, championship, and time attack. But I want to mention that challenges are pretty cool because often it's not just about coming in first. You'll have different objectives that you have to complete in order to actually pass it. For instance, some requirements may need you to improve your times each lap or maybe you can't use boost, or sometimes you never have to be in last place. And as you can see, the graphics are just beautiful for a Switch game. I especially want to point out that the car designs are pretty cool. Kind of reminds me of looking through car magazines and seeing concept cars, you know, from major car manufacturers. They're beautiful. This game is less than 20 bucks on the eShop and definitely worth a look, especially if you are into good racing games on Switch which, as you may know, they are few and far between. Next up is a really interesting shooter called Pa'arumi. I'll admit, on the surface, this may look like pretty much every other vertical style shoot 'em up that you've played before, but this one has a really interesting rock, paper, scissors style shooting mechanic that is gonna remind a lot of people of say those classics like Ikaruga. Your ship has three main attacks and one super attack. Now this is where it gets interesting because the three main attacks are all color coded to be either red, blue, or green. 
and you switch quickly between those by using the A, B, or Y buttons. You'll notice that the enemies are also color coded, meaning that if you use the same color of attack on the same colored enemy, well, you'll do less damage, but you'll help build up your shields. However, if you use the corresponding opposite color attack on the enemy, well, you'll end up doing more damage and you'll take them out quicker. For instance, let's say you use the red attack, well, that'll hurt more of a blue enemy. But it gets even more complicated than that, and I froze the game because I want to explain something, because it's really cool. So, notice in the left-hand corner there, you have the green, and it says boost shield. Now, right now, my ship is in green mode, meaning that if I shoot other green enemies with the green beam or the green attack, it'll damage them, but it will also boost up the shield. However, notice in the center there, red is the opposite color of green, and that'll do extra damage. And then on the right is blue, meaning that if I shoot a blue enemy, it'll start boosting that super attack. And so as you're playing the game, you're constantly swapping color attacks based on the color of the enemy. And so you can, you know, boost up your shields when you need to, you can boost up the, uh, the super attack, and then you can do extra damage when it's really important. And you're constantly playing this rock, paper, scissors mechanic. It's really cool. Also, the backgrounds just look fantastic. I mean, there's some of the best that I've seen on a new shooter this generation. Now, as you can guess, this game is definitely not easy to learn, but I will say after a while, it will become second nature. And again, having that bottom screen constantly updating and telling you what does what is awesome. Probably some of the downsides would be that, well, it is a little on the short side. There are only five levels, which, yeah, that's not great, but considering that there is a challenge mode and there's multiple difficulties plus online leaderboards to climb, there is a lot to enjoy with this game. Shoot'em up fans looking for something a little different should definitely not miss this game. Next up is Blazing Chrome. Oh man, if you are a fan of old school Contra or even Metal Slug, and you don't even get a little teary eyed when you boot this game up, there is something seriously wrong with you. As you can see from this footage, Blazing Chrome was created from scratch to be a love letter to those classic Genesis Super Nintendo arcade run and gun shooters. And I have to say, it nails it in almost every way. I mean, you have the old school 16-bit graphics, you've got the pretty unforgiving difficulty, plus I love and appreciate this lo-fi audio clips they have in here. Blazing Chrome. That is just hilarious. Initially, you can choose from two different characters, but you get to unlock more later. And like Contra or Metal Slug, there are a ton of weapon upgrades to pick up and even some vehicles to hop into. Plus, I'm digging the big set pieces and levels that you get to explore. I mean, just look at that parallax scrolling right there. It's just so awesome. And like any good old school run and gun shooter, well, the bosses are gonna be tough as nails, but you learn their patterns and after a while, you know, you're gonna die a couple times, but you will kick their ass. This is such a fun game. Everything blows up real good. If you like those kind of games, definitely check out Blazing Chrome. Next up, we have Broken Sword 5, The Serpent's Curse. So, I have a confession to make. I mention this every once in a while, but my local GameStop knows me really well. I actually really like the employees in there, and they are always looking out for me. So, this game got on my radar when said employee pointed it out one time when I went in there, and he was like, hey, there is this new adventure point and click game that came out on Switch. And he was wondering if I even knew about it. And I was like, what, really? I mean. That seems so random, but uh, yeah, I had to pick it up. Now, I'm actually really familiar with the Broken Sword series because it's been around, I believe, since the 90s. And in general, they are very well-made games. I've played a couple of them. And, you know, they're a nice mix of adventure, puzzle solving, plus they just have great characters. There's typically some sort of fantasy element involved in it, some sort of... I wouldn't, you know, sci-fi kind of mystical element to it, which I always like. Now, this one here, originally came out back in 2013, but it's now just being ported to the Switch. And I hadn't played this one before, so it was my first time playing it, and I do want to mention that even though this is the fifth game in the series, 
you don't have to have played the previous ones. They're all standalone games. Now this one starts out with a murder mystery in Paris, but quickly has you traveling all over the globe to try to solve the story behind this stolen painting. Has you investigating an ancient cult and at the end, potentially saving the world. And if you've ever played an adventure game before, this is gonna be very familiar to you. You do a lot of walking around and talking to other characters, which what I like about the Broken Sword series is that all the characters are just excellently voice acted here. They are fantastic and often hilarious. Thankfully, there was no one around to see me do this. Very interesting. But to do a lot of point and clicking around the scene to try to unlock clues as to what to do next. You also get items that will help you move the story along. Very typical stuff. What I noticed about this game over the previous ones I played is that this one has some of the best graphics in the series so far. As you can see here, the backgrounds are just truly beautiful. And I noticed that the characters this time are fully 3D polygon models and uh, fully animated, which is cool. I will say that unfortunately the story takes a couple hours to really get going. In the beginning, it's just, it's a little bit of a slog. You're not exactly sure what's happening or where it's going or why you should even care. But after you leave Paris, the, the area that you start in, it definitely starts to pick up. I also wanna point out this nice little Easter egg here that made me laugh. Do you recognize the album cover? Overall, I do like this game. It's an enjoyable adventure game for fans of the genre like me, and it can be picked up for less than $40 on physical. Next up is another shooter that got a physical release on Switch recently that I picked up. It's called Saivariar Delta. What's cool about this game is that unlike other shooters, this game doesn't have the traditional power-ups that you would normally fly over and pick up. Instead, you are encouraged, uh, no, not really encouraged, scratch that. It's more like required to fly as close to enemy bullets as possible to evolve your weapon. It's called buzzing. Thankfully, that leveling up happens pretty quickly because it can be pretty nerve wracking to try to get as close to all of those bullets as possible. It's definitely a, you know, risk versus reward scenario. You'll notice that this game has pre-rendered 2D graphics, which isn't to everybody's taste. I myself, I kind of like more traditional pixel style graphics, but it's not bad here. It looks good, it's clean. What's cool is that a lot of these shoot 'em ups on the Switch support in handheld mode, actually switching the screen into its vertical mode so that you actually get to see more of the gameplay, almost more like it would be in a real arcade. Which reminds me, I would eventually like to do that for my big 4K HD television. I guess you have to get a wall mount or something like that. Admittedly, I haven't played this game a ton yet. Uh, I just picked it up about a week ago. So if you're more familiar with it and if you have some recommendations for me, definitely post down in the comments below. Well guys, that's a quick look at some of the games I've been playing on my Switch lately. I'd love to know what you guys are playing on your Switch. Something tells me that a lot of you are gonna be playing Fire Emblem, I plan on picking that up too. That looks really awesome. So, all right guys, thanks very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here. Now obviously the Nintendo Switch is an undeniable success and one of the genres really kicking butt on the system are all the amazing shoot 'em up games. So in this video, I've teamed up with one of the experts on shoot 'em ups here on YouTube. Now you might be familiar with them. It's Sir Flash with Studio Mud Prince. And we're here to bring you the top 10 shoot 'em ups on the Nintendo Switch. Plus, at the end of the video, we're gonna include some honorable mentions. Let's take a look. Number 10. We're gonna start this list off strong with Arrow Fighters 2. Now, this was originally released in 1994 for the Neo Geo. Some of you may recognize this as it was called Sonic Wings 2 in Japan. Now, right off the bat, this game's kind of known for its really wacky characters that you get to choose from off the main menu. Get this, you can choose from a pop singer, a ninja, and yes, even a dolphin. This game is so bizarre. And to go along with those wacky characters, of course, it has a story mode, but it also has multiple endings. So what does it all mean? Well, it's all about gameplay. So each of these characters has their own ship and gameplay style. So you're probably gonna wanna try each of them. Aero Fighters 2 includes 10 stages, as well as a second playthrough loop with even more difficulty if you need it. 
But really, most of us are here because of the gameplay. We want a really great shooter, and this is definitely a good one. Although, I have to be honest, I think the graphics here are a bit on the simple or basic side. I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they look a little muddy. Now, that's not to say that I don't like the way that this game looks, but there's a reason why it's at number 10. And as we go along in this list, you're gonna see that definitely the bar gets raised when it comes to graphics. But again, I do like this game. It's a fun shoot 'em up with a lot of challenge and some classic shooter gameplay. Number nine. All right, I'm so excited to talk about Skyforce Reloaded on the Switch. I love this game. This is a vertical scrolling overhead shooter that at first glance probably seems like every other shoot 'em up that you played before, but you'd be wrong. Now, to be honest, this game is a little bit hard to describe because there's so much going on, but the way I think of it is a mix of a shoot 'em up and an RPG. And what I mean by that is that the game changes as you play it, as you complete missions, and as you unlock new collectibles. For instance, you can't complete a level with all of its objectives on the first or even sometimes the second playthrough. You need to level up almost like an RPG because you have to have the right ship, the right wingman, and a bunch of other factors to complete specific tasks. On one playthrough of a level, you might try and destroy 100% of the enemies. On the next playthrough of the same level, you might try picking up all the stranded humans, or maybe on the next playthrough, you'll try going through collecting all the stars, or you have to maybe try not getting hit. And just like an RPG, if you're not meeting your goals for that particular level, well, maybe you need to grind a little bit for stars, earning enough to unlock better armor, bullets, missiles, etc. It's because of this RPG-like depth that makes this game so addictive. I mean, check it out. I literally have 25 plus hours put into this game and I still keep coming back for more. I probably play this game every week. Number eight. Here is Hyper Sentinel. This is a shooter that's quite unlike most modern shooters and definitely stands out in our list. Now to many retro gamers like myself, well, this is gonna look very familiar to an old game called Uridium, which was quite popular in the 1980s on the home computers like say the ZX Spectrum, and of course my favorite, the Commodore 64. Basically the difference here from most shooters is that instead of having a huge scrolling play field, you get something here that is much more confined. It requires you to fly back and forth over the same area, taking out enemy targets while trying to avoid their fire. To me, because I'm old, this immediately started feeling like the classic arcade game Defender. You know how in that game you constantly flip back and forth? But here the action's even more deadly. Just trying to shoot down enemies while avoiding obstacles is really chaotic at first, but you'll quickly notice that when you flip, a little blue force field engages, making you kind of invincible for a second. Also, your ship energy recharges over time. You see it down there at the bottom there, that blue bar. Now that's very handy in a game like this because it can be pretty tough to stay alive. And as a love letter to those old computers, this version includes a ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, and CRT video filter that you can turn on if you wish. And you're damn right, I'm gonna play this game with the Commodore 64 filter turned on. Oh yeah, baby. And finally, consider that this game has over 100 levels to play through, which provides a ton of content for someone who's looking for something to play that's a little different than the normal shooter. Number seven. Hey everyone, this is Sir Flash from Studio Mud Prince and Bullet Heaven, and this is Zero Devs Tengai for Nintendo Switch. This particular title is the sequel to the vertically scrolling Samurai Aces, also on Nintendo Switch, but this one features human characters rather than the planes in the first game. Tengai was made by Saikyo, and it was the company's first horizontal, or Yoko, scroller. And that was kind of a big deal because Saikyo was best known for its intense, very difficult vertically scrolling shooters. Tengai continues this trend over the course of its seven stages. It has gameplay similar to games like Gunbird and Strikers 1945, complete with power-ups, charged attacks, and bombers, but in a horizontal layout rather than vertical. In Tengai, players take control of one of five selectable characters, each with their own fire patterns, charged attacks, and bombers. Figuring out which one works best for the player is half the fun, and it definitely plays into the game's replay. But Tengai is also pretty hard, so thankfully there are a number of different difficulty settings to choose from. It also has the kind of awesome pixel art we'd come to expect from a Psycho game. 
This is especially evident with Ten Guy's many lavish bomber attacks. It also has excellent character design, fantastic backgrounds, and the sort of atmospheric soundtrack that makes a game with this sort of setting really work. Better still, in Tengai, each character has their own story arc, and two-player games have unique and often humorous interactions depending on which character each player chooses. There's tons of replay for one player or two. It all comes together to make for a game that no Switch owner that's into shoot 'em up should be without. Number six. All right, coming in at number six is Blazing Star. So this is a horizontal style shooter released by SNK in 1998 for the Neo Geo. This game is kind of known for its simple yet effective two button gameplay. Like a lot of arcade games at the time, here you hammer the fire button for a rapid shot, or you can hold down the button to build up a meter for a more powerful charge shot. Now, a funny little story here, as I was playing this game and capturing the gameplay footage, you know, you're sitting there just hammering that fire button old school style, you know what I mean? Like you used to back in the arcades. Ugh, I mean, it just tires you out. But it was only later that I realized that there's a nice feature for this game under the options where you have the ability to turn on auto fire. Yep, that's a nice way of avoiding carpal tunnel. Also, I immediately noticed that the enemies drop tons of power-ups in this game, which is pretty nice for getting back to the level that you're at if you happen to die. And I'm really digging the graphics in this game. I mean, they're colorful, they're detailed, they're beautifully animated. Check out some of those pseudo 3D backgrounds there. It looks awesome. But those graphics do come at a cost. Now, this game does experience a bit of slowdown, especially in two-player co-op mode, but that's to be expected when you're trying to perfectly emulate that old hardware. Number five. Coming in at number five, oh yes, Zero Gunner 2 Minus by Psycho. So what's the story with this game? Well, originally it was an arcade game like so many others in this video, but then it famously came to the Japanese Dreamcast where it turned out to be one of the more collectible and expensive shoot 'em ups on that system. Now, that's kind of what makes it all the more great to see it released here on the Switch for such a reasonable price. And as you can see based on this gameplay footage, it's really known for its omnidirectional shooting system. Now you guys know this, that normally in a shoot 'em up, you're getting attacked either from like say the top or the bottom in a vertical shooter or maybe side to side. But in this game, enemies attack you from all angles. And the way that this works is that basically you hold down a button that lets you pivot your helicopter into the direction that you need. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, this actually takes a little bit of time to get used to. It's not quite a twin stick shooter like you would expect to play today because most modern games would use the two analog sticks. But in this game, it's a little bit different and takes a little bit of practice. I actually found holding down the auto fire button while rolling my finger to the pivot button did the trick and started to feel natural after a while. And I have to say they really dig those late 90s, early 2000s style of 3D graphics that they got going on here. If you're somewhat familiar with this game, you might be curious as to why it's called Zero Gunner 2 Minus on the Switch. The original game did not have that minus there. Well, it's worth noting that the original source code for this game was lost to time. And for the Switch release, the developer had to recreate the game from scratch. That's why this game is in 16 by nine and looks a little sharper than you might remember. But as you can see, they kept those kind of Dreamcast-like graphics. And I think that's pretty cool. I mean, they could have really radically changed this, but they decided not to. And with this redesign, the game is slightly easier than the original arcade and Dreamcast versions, which isn't necessarily a bad thing for an audience that may never have got to play the original. Number four. Let's talk a little about the Strikers 1945 series, not to be confused with Capcom's similar but very different 19XX series. Strikers 1945 is the psycho take on the World War II vertical shooter. Now the jury's out as to which one of the three that were made are the best, but Strikers 1945-2 is excellent by any standard, and the fine folks over at Zero Div saw fit to bring it to the Nintendo Switch as well. Strikers 1945-2 is played in Tate style over eight stages with super fast, difficult fire patterns and timing-based scoring. And it is pretty darn difficult at the best of times, so thankfully there's all kinds of different difficulty levels for players of a less intense nature. 
Now that's par for the course with many Seikyo games, but this one features a roster of six real-world planes to take on the enemy menace, including the fan favorite Flying Pancake. Each plane has its own fire pattern and can be leveled up several times, but Strikers 1945-2 in specific introduces a tiered charge attack system. Players can build a gauge to deploy more and more powerful charged attacks. The bomber attacks here are not only satisfyingly lavish, but also defensive. The support aircraft that fly in deal a ton of damage, but they can also shield the player from enemy shots. Strikers 1945-2 has all kinds of cool enemy units to take out, and every stage has a huge hulking boss that, more often than not, turns into a giant robot of some kind, which is pretty darn awesome. With its two-player co-op support as well as a Tate rotation mode for full-frame vertical gameplay, at home or on the go, shooting game fans should absolutely have this one on their Switch. Number 3 Oh yes, here we go, Gunbird 2 by Psycho. So this is one of those arcade shooters that includes a bizarre yet pretty silly storyline. In the game, you choose from six different characters. There are five off the main menu, and there's one that's unlockable, and each character has their own weapons and firing style. And the game is pretty lengthy, too. There are seven different stages, and each character within that stage has their own storyline. I have to admit that over time, I've actually started to appreciate the stories that these Japanese developers would put into these games. I mean, initially when I was a kid, it seemed kind of silly. I'd always skip through it, but... Now, as I'm older, I actually do think that they're pretty funny. I mean, there are some great characters here. Gunbird 2 is also known for, obviously, its gameplay, and there is a lot going on here. In addition to normal style firing attacks, you also have a strong melee attack, which is something you normally don't see in these kind of games. And those of you trying to get the best score in the game will enjoy how nuanced Gunbird 2 is. See those coins? Well, the value of the coin is determined whether its shiny face is towards you or not when you pick it up. So as if trying to shoot everything and just survive isn't enough, you've got all this other nuance to play with too. I really like Gunbird 2's mix of beautiful graphics, complex gameplay, and fun characters to make a unique and enjoyable experience. To say that Gunbird 2 is loved is an understatement, and it's great to see it here on the Switch. Number two. All right, in the number two spot, so close to being the best, is Danmaku Unlimited 3. So here's the deal. When I think of Japanese style bullet hell shoot 'em ups, this is one of the first games that comes to mind because this game loves to fill the screen with tons of bullets. There are a lot of things that make this game great, but I want to start off by talking about the spirit slash graze system that they have here, which basically promotes kind of risk versus reward gameplay. Basically, the closer you get to the enemy bullets, the quicker you build up your trance meter that's over on the right hand side there. That can activate a powerful beam that destroys almost everything in your path and it'll convert the bullets to gems. Now, I know what some of you are thinking out there is that you hear Japanese style bullet hell shooters and some of you get turned off on that. Well, I'm happy to report that one of the things I like about this game is that it's very beginner friendly. There's a beginner mode in this game that when you destroy the enemy, its bullets that are flying on the screen will get deactivated and turn into spirits so they can't harm you. That may seem like a small thing, but with so much going on in a game like this, it can really make a difference when you're starting off in this genre. And to make it even cooler, those deactivated bullets still count towards your graze or trance, so you can still use those to power up your main attack. And notice in this gameplay footage, your ship down there, notice that the hitbox is clearly defined and easy to see. I wish every game had that option. This game also supports Tate or Vertical mode to give you that arcade experience. And to round it all out, this game has an amazing rock and heavy metal soundtrack by the Japanese band Blank Field. It's amazing. With super tight controls, great gameplay, and a rockin' soundtrack, plus enough flexibility for beginners and hardcore players alike, it's hard to beat Danmaku Unlimited 3. And now, number one. I'm curious how many of you suspected that we were going to pick Ikaruga by Treasure 
as our number one pick in this video. I mean, it's not surprising. The game is one of the most beloved shoot 'em ups ever made, and it's great to see it on the Switch. So for those of you that don't know, Ikaruga is famous for its polarity mechanic, where you switch back and forth between white or black. While you are white, you can absorb any of the white bullets on the screen while doing extra damage to black enemies. And then vice versa. So when you're black, you can absorb the black bullets on the screen while taking damage from white and so on. Now this sounds simple and because of that, it plays differently than almost every other shoot 'em up out there. But I bet you can tell based on this gameplay footage that that simplicity is not necessarily easy. This game is tough. This game is painfully tough when you first start playing it. But thankfully it comes with a bunch of options to start off with, both in difficulty and also lives, continues, things like that. So it's also fair. And if you're like me, when you first start playing this game, you're going to lower the difficulty way down just simply to learn the levels, learn the patterns. And like every other good shoot 'em up on this list, check out those visuals. You know, it's no surprise, it's a treasure game. They always make great stuff. It's beautiful. I just love looking at it. And if you want more of an arcade feel, the game does support rotating the screen or going to Tate mode. Listen, Ikaruga is definitely one of the best shoot 'em ups ever made. It has enough complexity to keep you coming back to master its nuances again and again. If you have a Switch, pick it up. So that's our top 10 shoot 'em ups on the Nintendo Switch, but with so many great games on the handheld, here are some honorable mentions. If you're looking for a side-scrolling shooter with a hefty dose of random, Pixel Nest Studio Stared and Binary Stars is the shooter for you. The Binary Stars version is an update from the PC original, and every playthrough is unique, with random enemy waves, tons of cool weaponry and power-ups, and even a bunch of amazing secret encounters. There's also a complement of unlockable ships to earn throughout the game. The Binary Stars version also features a two-player mode and rocks a pretty amazing soundtrack to boot. Zero Div has released a ton of amazing Psycho shooting games for Nintendo Switch, and in our opinion, Dragon Blaze is definitely one of the best. It basically takes Gumper 2's core controls and makes them even better with a powerful dragon melee attack and all kinds of different ways to deal with your enemies. Players even have the ability to rotate the screen 90 degrees to play in vertical or tate mode. This allows players to play in full screen on a rotating monitor, or even on the go with a stand for the Switch. This is also the first time it saw release in North America, and it's super affordable. Definitely one to scoop up. Alright, so if you took William's 1981 classic Defender and smashed it together with a bunch of lolcats, Tiki Bod's Aqua Kitty would be the direct result. The Defender-style gameplay in Aqua Kitty UDX is as frantic as ever, and it comes complete with special weapons, sharp pixel-style graphics, and really cute cat sounds. Aqua Kitty has seen release on other systems, but the Switch's UDX version is obviously the definitive one, with extra missions and modes including the awesome Dreadnought mode, not to mention two-player support at home or on the go. Digital Reality Grasshopper Manufacturer and THQ Nordic Cinemora EX has also seen release to all other major platforms, but the Switch version is notable for having just about the same visual clout as the PS4 and Xbox One versions. It also sports the same asymmetrical two-player mode, but unlike other versions, it also has the benefit of being played solo or with a friend anywhere you might be. In addition to its amazing graphical style, Cine Mora EX also features some awesome time manipulation mechanics and an intricate, dark story for players to chew through. And finally, we've saved the best for last. We have Xenoraid from 10 Tons. Like Steradin, it also has great roguelite mechanics, a wide variety of ships to use as the game progresses, and a great weapon and ability loadout that can be mixed and matched in really strategic ways. But it also has an awesome system for its lives, since each is represented by a unique craft in your squadron. Neater still, up to four players can use one of these craft for great frantic co-op gameplay. It sports probably the best four-player shooting action on the Switch, so whether you're playing alone or with your friends, it's definitely one to check out. I want to give a huge shout out to Sarah Flash from Studio Mud Prints because I reached out to him when I was thinking about doing this video and honestly there was nobody better to do this with me because his channel is dedicated to nothing but shoot 'em ups and I have learned so much from watching his videos. If you haven't checked out his YouTube channel and you like this genre, you absolutely need to. It's amazing. All right guys, have a great day.